Hello, my friends. This is Pastor Christopher Alam, and I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I trust you and your household, you are doing well in all things and that you are blessed. We are in the subject of uh, the call of God, and we are discussing different aspects of the call of God. And we have talked about how God called people in the Old Testament, God called people in the New Testament, and then we have talked about supportive ministries, you know, different different aspects of the call. And now we are talking about certain qualities you need to develop in your life if you are called to serve God. And when I say serve God, I don't mean just in the fivefold ministry gifts as an apostle, prophet, um, evangelist, pastors and teachers. God calls people to do other things also. And those are the supportive ministries in the body of Christ. And that, that can mean anybody, anything from elders and deacons to uh, to people who help in churches and, uh, um, you know, the lady who works in her office and helps us. And, and, and you know, without, without supportive ministries, everything would come to a standstill. So don't think that because you're not called to be, uh, you know, an apostle or a prophet or a pastor, teacher, evangelist, that there is something wrong with you. No, God can use you. In fact, in the Bible, the first martyr of the church was Stephen. And Stephen was in a supportive ministry. His job was to wait tables to feed the widows. And the Bible says that he was a man full of, uh, full of uh, faith, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Ghost. And God did amazing signs and wonders and miracles through his hands. So God wants to use all of us. And he uh, wants to put us in a place of his choosing where we can serve him. And that's wonderful because many of you, you are hearing me, you know, you would never be become a pastor or an evangelist or a, or a teacher or a prophet or, 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 or whatever, but, but God still has a plan and a purpose for you and he wants to use you. And you may feel a tug in your heart to serve in some different cap, uh, capacity, like my friend Larry Fry. He, he came and fixed up our office and that's his calling. And, and he and his wife also do some uh, classes for married couples and that is also his calling. So they, people serve God in different ways. But remember two things. Firstly, every calling is of God. When God calls you, it is always God who calls you. And it's not you, it's the call of God. The second thing is that nothing that is done for Jesus by anybody is ever insignificant. Everything that is done in response to the call of God is significant in the kingdom of God. Now, that being said, there are certain qualities that need to be developed. And we are in the first quality, which is character. We have to develop character. And the reason we have to develop character is that our character is ultimately our testimony, our witness to the world. That is what people look at. And so we have to develop uh, our, you know, develop our lives and develop ourselves in our character. And, uh, and yesterday, when we finished, we were talking about purity and holiness. And uh, in Colossians 3, 5, it tells us how, what we should do. It says, therefore, put to death. Put to death, that means to kill, to execute, to put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. So what he's saying is this, that there are things, although we are saved, we are born again, we are children of God, our names are written in the book of life, there are still forces at work, firstly because we still are carrying this old flesh, that's the first reason, we live in this flesh and although our spirits are born again, our minds are not born again, they need to be renewed and our flesh, which is a combination of our mind, our emotions and our body, um, that's what we call the human flesh. Flesh actually means body, but in this case, it's our minds, emotions, our will, our flesh. It has to be brought to submission to the, to the word of God and to the spirit of God. But because we are normal human beings, now these are temptations that beset a normal human being. Just because these things happen to you, it doesn't mean you're a bad person or you're worse than anybody. These things happen to us. To all of us temptation it came even to Jesus the Bible says Jesus was tempted in all things just as we are not only that but Jesus was the person 
on this earth who was more tempted by anybody else because look I'm tempted by certain things but there are certain things I'm not tempted by you are tempted by other things that I'm not tempted by we are all different but Jesus Christ was tempted by all things that can ever beset any human being on this earth but he was without sin so he overcame those temptations but the fact is that um, we have this flesh to contend by contend with and our minds are not totally renewed and then secondly there is still a devil who is around you know satan is still around although he has been defeated he's still alone he's the father of lies and he lies to us and he puts things in our minds and those are things that he's able to do and so and at the same time we live in a fallen world there is sin there's uncleanness all around us there's demons all around us so all these things working together they bring temptations in our path and temptations come and uh, but here's the thing uh, the bible tells us uh, that we in, in ephesians chapter 1 it says we have been made holy and blameless in his sight so god has declared us holy and blameless in christ jesus and that is how he sees and sees us in christ yet that is the paradox that is built into this as in every other aspect of walking with God that although we have been made holy the Bible still tells us that without holiness no man shall see the Lord and that uh, we should pursue holiness without which no man shall see the Lord and then there's a commandment which says be ye holy even as your father in heaven is holy so we are commanded to be holy we are commanded to live holy although we have been legally declared to be the uh, you know the righteousness of God in Christ and we have been declared to be holy it's the same way in which we are healed by his stripes and Jesus has borne all our diseases and yet there are times we have to fight diseases uh, on this earth and sicknesses and sometimes it's a lifelong fight and it's a long lifelong fight of faith so that is the paradox we live in the spiritual reality of what Christ has done on us Uh, 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 done in our lives and at the same time we live in a fallen world with unrenewed minds and the things that come with it and we have to fight to take our place in Christ until our human experience actually lines up with what what with who we are in Christ now uh, one thing is that is very dangerous is when we overemphasize certain truths of the word of god at the expense of other truths say for example Uh, there's a teaching on grace and i am a strong believer in grace i believe that grace of god i believe that jesus came with grace and through him we have received grace upon grace and that by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god and so uh, grace is the is actually the foundation for everything we must understand in understand grace i believe one of the problems is in the church is that they don't understand grace enough because uh, you see thing is that without understanding grace you cannot even be strong in faith so we have to understand grace and i in fact i that's one of the subjects i taught um, a couple of months ago about grace and faith and the balance of grace and faith but but here's my point my point is that uh, sometimes uh, you know we we lean on the great grace side and then we tend to ignore other scriptures that address the same issue so we can say well i'm i've been made righteous and holy and blameless in his sight so uh, jesus has taken all my sins away so um, there's no more requirement on me so and all this talk that people talk about be holy and live holy uh, those things are legalism firstly that is a serious error Uh, because the bible does say that without holiness no man can see the lord so if you if you uh, deride and you speak against holiness and you ignore holiness and you talk about holiness as being legalism you're putting in yourself in great danger uh, thinking that you are very safe because you believe in grace but without holiness you shall not see the lord so it is very very important because these things are essential for us and um, so there are certain christian disciplines that are as valid as the teachings on grace there are scriptures on christian disciplines that are just as valid and as much for to us today 
as are the scriptures on grace. Say, for example, let me give you some of them. Uh, studying the scripture, you know, that is a valid, very valid thing today. Although we are under grace and we are complete in Christ, um, pursue righteousness. That is a Christian discipline. Although we have been made righteous by, by Christ through the blood of Jesus, to pursue righteousness, to study the scriptures, to live a life of prayer, right? Not only that, but even things like evangelize, win souls, because Jesus gave us a command, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. All these Christian disciplines, to love one another, to serve people, all these Christians, this Christian disciplines are just as valid as the scriptures and grace. And the most foolish thing we can do is to take the scriptures on grace and pit them against all these other scriptures and say, well, this is grace. All these other scriptures are, are all legalistic because Jesus was not saying them to us, then the Old Testament and those people living under the law or to say, oh, these scriptures are for the Gnostics. They are not for Christians. Listen, that is very, very dangerous. But what you, you and I have to do is take the scriptures on grace and holiness as well as take the scriptures, uh, you know, the scriptures on grace and what Christ has done for us upon the cross and take all these other scriptures that talk us, uh, talk to us about how to walk with God and living holy and serving God and studying the scripture and prayer and bring them all together. And it is when we marry them together, that is when we come into what is called the full counsel of the word of God. And that is what is what Christian maturity is. Christian maturity and wisdom is to know what Christ has already done for us at the cross of Calvary and how it belongs to us. And yet at the same time, we live our lives in pursuit of holiness and in pursuit of, uh, you know, there are certain things we do. This is just how we walk and this is what is required of us. So to put these things together and then, but it's very interesting, the scripture in Colossians 3 to 5, it says, Put to death your members which are on the earth. That means there are things on the earth that beset us every day. They are around the corner. And we have to take those things, face those things and put them to death. So fornication and adultery. We don't yield to them because we are already forgiven. You put it to death. Uncleanness and passion and evil desire and covetousness. Covetousness. That means the love of material things is right there on the list with fornication. We have to put covetousness to death. Yet there are those who, who say fornication is wrong and, 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 and uncleanness is wrong. But covetousness is okay. To desire to live for material things, that's okay because that's prosperity. No, all these things have to be put to death because they all have the same source. But anyway, so... Uh, purity and, ho and holiness are very necessary if we are to serve God. But now let's go to the next thing. And that is integrity, integrity. And in 2 Corinthians, uh, I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 to 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. Because you see, when the books of the Bible were written, there were no chapter and verse divisions. They were all written as one. It was the translators who put in the chapter and verse divisions. And unfortunately, the translators put a division right there in the middle of the context. So let us uh, take away that little barrier there and read all the way from 2 Corinthians 3, 18 to the first two verses of uh, chapter 4, 1 and 2, because Second Corinthians 3, 18 is actually the last verse of chapter 3. So we're going to read the last verse of chapter 3 plus the first two verses of chapter 4. Then we'll, re we'll be reading the whole thing in context. Now, uh, here in Second Corinthians chapter 3, um, uh, you know, towards the end of the chapter, Paul talks about uh, how how uh, um, uh, how the glory of God was upon Moses and how he had the veil over his face. And he says, even today, when the Jews who, who have not been enlightened by, you know, by, uh, by, by the light of Christ shining upon them, how they, uh, their minds are still veiled when they read the Old Testament, they can't see Jesus. But then he talks about us, where he says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy we faint not. 
but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So what he's saying is that uh, he's basically saying that when the Jews hear the Old Covenant, the Old Testament being read, they still have the veil over their faces so that they cannot see Jesus. That's why it is. They cannot see the glory of Jesus. But he says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what it means is that they, when they read the scriptures, the veil is still upon them. But we with unveiled faces, with open unveiled faces, we behold the face of the Lord. We see the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Then that is, that is a new covenant blessing that we as the children of God washed in the blood of Jesus. Uh, you know, there is really just, just think of it. Uh, what, what difference is there between those whose faces are veiled and those whose faces are not well, people like you and me. It is not because we are better than them, but it is because we have heard the gospel and because we have heard the gospel, we have received Jesus Christ. And because we have received Jesus Christ, the veil is removed in Christ. The veil has been removed and we can see the glory of the Lord face to face because Moses talked to God face to face. So we can also talk to God face to face. And that is why, uh, that is why the gospel must be preached to the Jewish people. It's because although they are God's covenant people, they cannot see the glory of the Lord because they have not heard the gospel. So Christ hasn't shined on them as yet. So that is why this is just a little uh, thing I'm putting in extra it has nothing to do with the subject. But the reason their faces are veiled is because um, they have not heard the gospel. And because they have not heard the gospel, their faces are veiled. Although they, what they read is the word of God, the old covenant, the old testament is the word of God. Although they read the word of God, because their faces are veiled, they are still spiritually blind. They cannot see. They cannot see the light of God. But we because of grace, because of the grace of God, because of this wonderful salvation we have received, we look at the face of Jesus. Hallelujah. And it says, we all with open face beholding like in a glass the glory of the Lord. So we look at the face of Jesus with unveiled faces. And what we see is the wonderful face of Jesus. And when we look at the wonderful face of Jesus, we see the glory of the Lord shining from the face of Jesus. And as we spend our time beholding the glory of the Lord, we ourselves are changed. And the Bible says we go from this image, we go from glory to glory until we are like that image. And that is a lifelong process. There's a lifelong process going in our lives and, and God's ultimate goal is to conform us, you and me, to the image of Christ. God wants to conform you and me to the image of Christ. God wants to, you know, right where I am today, I've been walking on this way for 45 years and December the 13th, 1975. Uh, it'll be 45 years. I'm almost 45 years in Christ. But during this 45 years, uh, I have seen how God step by step has been doing his work in me. And I am much more like Jesus today than I was 45 years ago when I first met him. And I'm still work in progress. And when will I be perfect and complete? There will come a day when I'll be totally 100% like Jesus when that work uh, of God conforming to the image of his son, that work will be complete. And that is the day when I leave this world and I stand before Jesus and see him face to face. And in first John, we have this wonderful promise that uh, when we shall see him face to face, we shall just be like him. And the Bible says, and this is the glorious hope of the gospel. And whoever lives with this hope, keeps himself holy. You know, we talked about holiness. Now we are talking about integrity. Uh, uh, what happens is that when we behold the face of the Lord, uh, 
we we are transformed and we become like him and that is the glorious hope that is the greatest hope of uh, of the gospel and we hope for a lot of different things you know and a lot of things we are faithful things we are hoping for but the greatest thing of all is to be like Jesus and if we live with this hope if this hope burns within us we keep ourselves holy because we don't want anything to enter into our life that will stop this process now i must stop here and just tell you what integrity is integrity is when you uh, when you live your life in a way so that it lines up with your biblical convictions that you know you know in your heart and your mind as a christian uh, what it is to live and how we should live and how we should conduct ourselves in our lives and integrity is when you make a decision to line up your your life so that it is in line with what you believe to be true from the scriptures say for example i know that dishonesty is wrong right dishonesty with money is wrong so i know it is wrong i mean you don't have to tell me i just know it from the scriptures that it is wrong it's a part of my conviction so what would happen is that when i have money in my hand that is given to the work of god and i use it on myself that is a lack of integrity because my action does not line up with my conviction so integrity is when you say one thing because you believe one thing and you say it but you also live it when your life actually lines up with what you believe and what you say that is integrity amen and god wants us to be men of integrity so anyway but going going back to the scripture it says that you know that is god's ultimate goal so but every day we have this process that is why every single day we have to live a life of devotion and worship when i come before the lord and i say lord i just want to thank you i honor you and just you know one of the most important things is your personal devotion and your personal relationship with god that intimacy that personal type time of intimacy and that is when we come before god and we worship him and we behold the glory of the lord and as we behold the glory of the lord the glory of the lord shines upon us it comes upon us and then as the glory of the lord shines upon us as we behold the face of jesus it says we are changed into that image that we see the glory of jesus the glory that is shining on the face of jesus i am being changed from glory to glory from one level of glory to another that is that means for me in my case i'm being changed from being christopher alam in the flesh to jesus and that is a process that's going on in my life every time i choose to stop and to gaze at the face of jesus so it says verse and then the next verse says therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy we faint not what does it mean that means that this this thing is about beholding the face of the lord and beholding his glory in his face and being transformed that is our ministry that is the ministry we have received many people think that the believers first and primary ministry is to go and preach the gospel it is not the believers first ministry primary ministry is not the ministry of reconciliation is uh, as in second corinthians 5:17 or on 5:18 uh, i'm sorry 5:18 the believers primary ministry is to minister to the lord and to be in his presence and be transformed by beholding his glory we have received this ministry because it is from this ministry that your life springs forth that you you know you give this is where you should give your priority to above serving god above preaching the gospel like martha and mary martha was busy serving but jesus said about mary she just sat at his feet and gazed at his feet at his face and listened to his words and uh, and when martha complained jesus said said martha you're busy about many things but mary has chosen the best part the best part is to behold the face of the lord and once we behold his faith and and you know his face and we are transformed from glory to glory that's when we get 
get up and we carry that glory to the world and we preach the gospel. Because if you have faced Jesus, you can face any man, you can face any disease, you can face any demon. So our primary ministry, it says that therefore seeing that we have this ministry of beholding the glory of the Lord face to face as we have received mercy and this has been given to us totally by mercy and grace. He says, we faint not, we don't give up, but what do we do? But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You see, integrity, if you try to do integrity on your own, it is very difficult because on one side you know what the Bible says, you know what you believe, you know what your convictions are, but your flesh strives towards the other, in the other direction. And so your flesh wants to do this. And that's why people fail. It's not because they don't know right for long, wrong. And in many cases, it's not because they don't want to do the right thing, but they do the right, wrong thing anyway, because the flesh is too powerful. But you know what happens when we spend time before the Lord, and we are covered with the glory, the purity, the holiness, which is the glory of God. It comes upon us. You know what happens? We renounce the hidden things of, of, of dishonesty. All these things about, about, um, about dishonesty, about, and it says, not walking in craftiness, people being crafty, telling lies and half-truths, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And it's here it's talking about preachers who preach the word, but sometimes people use the word to get money out of people, use the word to get, uh, to deceive people, use the word to tell half-truths and lies, to, you know, to, pres listen, all these things are of the flesh and people actually, um, you know, they handle the word of God deceitfully and they're dishonest and they're crafty and they're clever. They say one thing, they mean another, half truths half and half lies which are designed to deceive and to manipulate people. He said, what happens when we spend time in the glory of the Lord? We are so caught up in the glory of the Lord. And you know, when you spend time in the glory of God, you are so pure that suddenly all these things fall off. I remember many, many years ago when I was in Burma and the Lord touched me for six months. <coughs> I had, I, I can't, I don't want to go into describing it, but I lived, I had this strong presence of God. And you know what happened? One of the things that came out of it, I became so sensitive to even the littlest things, that things that I never thought as being sinful, but just human, not bad things, but things you and I wouldn't even think were bad. Suddenly they stood out as sinful and I would begin to weep because one of the things is that when you're in the presence of God, your, your conscience get tender. You become very sensitive to the Holy Spirit and things that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, um, um, how do you say, uh, that, uh, um, disgrieve the spirit of the Lord, they become grievous to us. So that is, uh, you know, so that's why it says, he who, uh, you know, he who lives in this hope that one day we'll be like Jesus, he keeps himself pure. And so let us do that. Let us pursue holiness and let us pursue integrity and walk with God with purity and holiness and let, <coughs> let the Father do his work in our lives. God bless you. I'll be seeing you tomorrow, but let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I ask you to touch them. Do a wonderful, wonderful work in all our lives, myself included. Lord, and let us walk with you. Make us more like you, dear Jesus. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's it. I'll be seeing you again tomorrow. God bless you.